Welcome, and um, my name is Margo Nishimura. I'm the Deputy Director and Librarian of the John Carter Brown Library. And on behalf of our Director, Ted Widmer, and the dedicated staff of the JCB, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program in which we celebrate the opening of Mind Your Business, Records of Early American Commerce from the John Carter Brown Library. This is an exhibition that does many things. It connects the library more closely than usual to the campus of Brown and the city of Providence and the business enterprises that made all possible. And I do want to just say a special welcome to our new board member, Sylvia Brown, who is um, great, great granddaughter, am I right? Of, um, of Nick, John, John Carter Brown, and uh, who is here with us from London this evening. Um, the exhibition also demonstrates how important the JCB collections are for the study of economic history. And it shows off our manuscripts for which we're not as well known as our printed books and maps and other materials. I'd like to take just a minute or two to acknowledge all the hard work that went into the exhibition. This was Kim Nusko's first exhibition and I can't imagine it having come together any more beautifully than it has. So I want to just commend Kim for this. It's been a lot of work and all well, well worth it. Um, Susan Danforth helped with the installation and added texture and depth to the displays. Ken Ward selected examples of financial record keeping from the Spanish colonial period to add an international dimension. And Leslie Tobias Olson prepared the fabulous website that will allow you to enjoy the exhibition from anywhere, anywhere in the world forever. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the generosity of one of our newest board members, Ira Unschuld, who is Brown class of 1986, and I also want to add 1985 winner of the Stillwell Prize for book collecting, um, which has very special meaning for us, uh, since the JCB's Watts program now co-sponsors that prize. Um, and I want to acknowledge Ira for his financial support of the preservation and maintenance of our business archives, especially the Arnold family papers and related programming, including this exhibition and this talk and the um, academic symposium that will happen tomorrow as well. So I hope you'll take some time to enjoy the exhibition after this evening's talk, which I will now turn to. Um, here, I need to thank, apart from Seth, whom I'll get to in a minute, um, Jeremy Mumford, visiting assistant professor in history and academic projects associate here at the JCB. Jeremy has helped me tremendously with planning for this evening's program and along with Seth in the planning for tomorrow's academic symposium on paper technologies of capitalism, which happens to be the title of our lecture tonight. Okay, so Seth Rockman. Seth received his BA from Columbia and his PhD from UC Davis. In 2004, he left Occidental College in Los Angeles to join the history department here at Brown, which made him an automatic uh, good friend of the JCB. His 2009 um, book, and I just want to mention that Seth has many, many accomplishments and achievements, but um, to to allow him to get up here sooner, I'm going to keep it brief and just mention that Seth's 2009 book, Scraping By, Wage, Labor, Slavery, and Survival in Early Baltimore, has won, won the OAH's Merle Curdy Prize, which is one of the most important book prizes in history, uh, the Philip Taft Labor History Book Award, and the H.L. Mitchell Prize for the Southern, for the Southern Historical Association. Seth's currently writing a new book about shoes, shovels, hats, and hoes manufactured in the North for use on Southern slave plantations. Tonight, however, I understand blackboards are involved, and rather than leather, iron, and wood, we'll be hearing about paper, the paper technologies of capitalism, that is. So uh, please help me welcome Seth Rockman. Well, thank you all for coming. It is uh, an honor to be speaking tonight uh, at the opening of Mind Your Business, uh, an exhibit of the JCB's extraordinary collection of early American business records. And I want to echo uh, 
Uh, Margo in congratulating the exhibition's curator, Kim Nusko, uh, who has made her way through the detritus of 18th and 19th century commercial life and assembled a visually arresting display uh, that I will discuss this evening as the paper technologies of capitalism. Uh, I'm hoping that I can ask you to join me in a round of applause for Kim on this accomplishment. Yes. yes, if you're looking, she's over, over there. Um, also, of course, to thank Margot Nishimura, Jeremy Mumford, and the staff of the JCB for their uh, generous enthusiasm and support of this talk. And of course, to thank again uh, Ira Unschuld uh, for helping bring the history of business and the history of capitalism to the JCB. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome four visiting scholars, uh, Ben Kafka, Will Derringer, Jonathan Senshin, and Caitlin Rosenthal, who are here uh, to help us uh, think more deeply about the paper technologies of capitalism in a symposium that will take place on campus tomorrow. And I'm really looking forward to that. Now, I'm going to tell you that it was a pleasure uh, to be spared the difficult work of curating this exhibition, an exhibition of this scope drawn as it is from thousands of boxes of archival material, scores of ledger, ledgers and account books, and shelves upon shelves of books detailing uh, the commercial prospects and practices of the new world. Not being the curator, then, it isn't my task tonight to explain to you the rationale behind the selection of what you see before you in the various display cases. Rather, I've been given a different assignment. Uh, to investigate what kind of questions emerge from business ephemera, to put bills of lading, letters of credit, and logbooks in the service of a scholarly agenda, and to take a bunch of stuff that I think is really neat to look at and gesture towards how it might be really useful to think with. So what you'll hear tonight, then, is not only an appreciation of the business archive and, and a glorious testament to the assiduous record keeping of the early modern period, but also a preliminary framework for deploying the business archive towards the broadest questions that organize historical research today. Uh, you'll be surprised, I suspect, over the coming minutes to find that this path may wind its way through the history of the stock ticker, the spreadsheet, uh, even the office memo. But my goal here is to draw on analogous, if anachronistic, artifacts of business practice to suggest the kind of thinking that might be done with the materials on display here. Now, the phrase paper technologies of capitalism was meant to be somewhat jarring. In our digital age, the phrase paper technology sounds oxymoronic. One is reminded of the novelist Gary Steingart's memorable phrase for books in his recent The Super Sad Loves True Love Story. He called them non-streaming media artifacts. <laughs> and in our era of content and data mining, the kind of indexes that facilitated the retrieval of accounts in the 18th century and that defined what Caitlin Rosenthal has called in another context, uh, early modern IT, uh, are at best quaint and at worst laughably inefficient. Uh, at the same time, technology of capitalism is meant to evoke something completely different. Steam engines, the whirl of factory machinery, uh, but not unwieldy ledgers that constituted early modern data management. The juxtaposition of paper and capitalism reminds us of the problems of representation inherent to finance, those emerging from money's fundamental existence as a system of writing, as one scholar has put it, uh, and basically to think through the ways in which technology or capitalism itself revolves around the kinds of truth claims, the kind of authorities, the kind of authority, the kind of networks that are ultimately articulated and enforced through print. Now, to some ears here, the phrase "paper technologies of capitalism" may sound perfectly sensible. After all, early modern Europe witnessed an outpouring of paper instruments, paper materials such as assemble for yourself astrolabes, books with fold out sundials, and other tools that served commercial integration across great distances in the first phase of global integration. Quite literally, these are technologies made of paper uh, that functioned akin to their more durable metallic rivals. These have been featured in a recent Harvard exhibition or the subject of a current Princeton dissertation and have gotten a lot of attention from early modern European historians of science. But my use of paper technology is somewhat less literal tonight. Uh, and I take my lead from the possibilities conveyed in an observation by the historian John Brewer some 20 years ago. Evaluating the British state at the start of the 18th century, Brewer contended, quote, its key technology was not derived from the arts of war, but from the counting house, slips of paper rather than shot and cannon, 
slide rules rather than blades of swords. Now, the extent to which tools of measurement and record keeping accounted for the emergence of the first British Empire uh, is not something I'm prepared to evaluate tonight. But I'm certainly inspired by Brewer's appreciation of the mundane in the largest processes of historical transformation. And that will be the subject of my talk. Now, such observations have become more commonplace in recent years, uh, especially in histories of the economic past that take things like salt and cod, tobacco, and other humble commodities and proclaim the degree to which they have changed the world. Uh, the intermodal shipping container, as Mark Levinson has argued in his book, The Box, was the foundational technology of globalization in our own period, uh, crucial to any understanding of the last half century uh, of the modern world. Uh, in contrast, for the early modern period, um, scholars have drawn attention to the price current, sometimes known as the prices current, a printed sheet of exchange rate and commodity prices in a specific market like Antwerp or London, and this gets credit for what the historian John McCusker calls, quote, the mantra of the modern business world, better, faster, cheaper, what he calls the, for the font of the information revolution. Now, of course, we live in a moment when NASDAQ technicians are fretting over the loss of one one millionth of a second in executing a trade. And to that extent, it might seem inconceivable or, or absurd to imagine that there was anything revolutionary at all about measuring prices at a given moment, undertaking the laborious work of printing them, addressing them to individual correspondents in distant locales, waiting for a ship to head in that direction, biding your time as uh, the, the document passed over an ocean, and waiting your time for a ship to come in to exchange goods uh, for what you have to offer. This could be a year or more. And yet this excruciatingly slow business press, according to Ms. McCusker, significantly reduced the cost of information. Moreover, price currents, or prices current, constructed the new webs of exchange uh, that were crucial to early modern global integration, but because their circulation usually involved the conventions of letter writing, addressed as they were to known individuals in other ports, the network ran along fibers of reputation and trust that enforced contracts much more effectively than any court could do in that period. The price current's ability to render everything from ashes to wheat, anchors to whale fins, in equivalent currencies helped create the very concept of the commodity. And contrary to its seemingly artless design, the juxtaposition of so many goods on a single page made it possible to visualize, to see opportunities for arbitrage right in front of you. So here we have a modest price list turned into the paper technologies of capitalism. Now, as I thought more tonight about this exhibition, or as I thought in preparation for tonight about this exhibition of business ephemera, it struck me that this entire endeavor unfolds at the intersection of three concurrent conversations in historical scholarship, conversations that occasionally overlap, but more often exist in isolation, owing perhaps to the scholarly geographies created by departments and journals and conferences. The three things I want to focus on tonight are first, a new history of capitalism that has emerged in recent years that is a distinctive field of inquiry. Second, I want to suggest that an exhibition of this nature rides the wave of current, a current scholarly fascination with physical, tactile aspects of the past, what might be called the material turn away from abstraction and unmoored language and towards the medium as being as essential as the message, away from passive objects towards things that have been imbued with agency unto themselves. And finally, this exhibit activates fundamental issues in science and technology studies pertaining to knowledge production as embedded in networks of practice and communities of practitioners, but ultimately delimited by the nature of their shared instrumentation and their methods of representation. So in the talk that follows, I'm going to move us through the history of capitalism, the current interest in material studies, and finally, the new science and technology studies, and think about how these things come together to make what would otherwise be a bunch of discrete bills of lading, account books, actually a coherent whole that may help us think through large historical problems. Again, taking things that are interesting to look at and trying to make them useful to think with. So first, the history of capitalism. Capitalism's ascent has, of course, proven an enduring historical topic. 
generation of liberal theorists have proclaimed capitalism the inevitable handmaiden of democratic polities as nation and economy alike channel many simultaneous private interests into a relatively stable and unquestionably free society. Alternatively, generations of Marxist scholars have proclaimed capitalism the inevitable stage of social development necessary to generate the required industrial capacity to sustain an eventual worker's utopia. In addition to these two common uh, descriptive uh, paths, uh, the model-driven methods of neoclassical economics tend to place capitalism outside of history itself as an inexorable market mechanism ever seeks equilibrium, demolishes inefficiencies, maximizes utilities, and purportedly distributes the fruits of the material world in a just manner. Add to this recent work in evolutionary psychology that has supposed the timelessness of an acquisitive human nature defined by the proclivity to buy low and sell high. All of these are historical accounts of the history of capitalism and all of them are in conversation with one another. But what distinguishes a new history of capitalism from celebratory liberal accounts, pessimistic Marxist ones, and mechanistic neoclassical ones is a commitment to what scholars refer to as denaturalizing capitalism, by which we mean considering capitalism's governing institutions, practices, and ideology as something more than the inevitable telos of human development and something more than the outcome of inexorable market forces. Now, historians may be rather late to this discussion. Sociologists have spent the last 30-some years debating Mark Granovetter's theories of embeddedness, Economists rightly note that the new institutional economics of Ronald Coase or Douglas North are hardly new at all. Fair enough, I'm willing to grant that, and in that case, it's been with the zeal of the converted that historians have raced to capitalism, eager to locate its rules, legal, social, cultural, uh, in time and space, to think about the ways in which the rules that determine access to market resources and establish who will work for whom under what terms how these things have come into being as contingent, as time and place specific, rather than timeless and inevitable. As importantly, historians of capitalism have brought together numerous subfields that have existed apart from one another over the last 30 to 40 years of scholarly production, business history, labor history, economic history, political economy, and history of economic thought, and have brought them under the same umbrella, trying to create a new conversation and bring together labor and capital as necessary together for understanding the history of capitalism. Historians of capitalism has, have been methodologically promiscuous, using cultural and intellectual history to consider the process by which capitalism can be understood as inevitable and timeless. They've been informed by some of the basic observations of the present, for instance, that the state never actually disappears, or that human trafficking can thrive even in advanced market societies, to situate the early modern era's mercantilist states and the transatlantic slave trade within the history of capitalism rather than outside it. So the robustness of the history of capitalism uh, as a discrete yet inclusive endeavor can be seen in the proliferation of scholarly research groups at places like Harvard, uh, it, the appearance of historiographical essays tracing the contours of the field, as in the recent American History Now volume published by the American Historical Association, and even the posting of academic appointments specifically in the history of capitalism, such as the one my department is doing now, applications due October 15th. <laughs> now, some of the most exciting work being done presently involves what the historian Jeff Sklansky has called capitalist ways of seeing. Preceding the study of production, distribution, and consumption are questions regarding the creation and organization of knowledge grounded in specific methods of record keeping and representation and illustrative of a larger uh, epistemology predicated on quantification, on the application of the commodity form to a growing list of goods and services, and on the prospect of long-term efficiency. Scholars have paid particular attention to the technologies that facilitate capitalist ways of seeing, whether the ledger book, the organizational chart, the spreadsheet, or the demand curve. These are all technologies of creating fact, and I think these are things that often are lost upon us, to take things that are, seem so commonplace, right? When we open up Excel, well, we're just logging on to a spreadsheet. No, we're engaged in a technology of creating fact. We're creating economic knowledge. We are rendering the vast complexities of the world into a distilled form to promote some kind of rational business decision making. 
But as scholars are careful to argue from this observation, what is seen, what is understood, what alternatives are imaginable are all constrained by the instrumentation itself. That's true when we look at economic statistics uh, that, for, in, for instance, may count waged labor towards growth but lack the means of accounting for the vast unpaid labor of social reproduction, cooking laundry, making dinner, things like that. This is also true with forms, right? Blank, pre-printed documents that establish certain kind of transactions as natural, normal, unproblematic, leaving, in, uh, leaving only space to fill in the details. Six hogsheads of rum, 17 iron bars, two Bambara women to be filled in by the people executing the trades. Again, the forms, the technologies, the instruments establish capitalist ways of knowing. And this is a significant insight of the new scholarship. And much of the what's on display here in this exhibit tonight uh, is a testament to this kind of capitalist epistemology. Uh, none, perhaps, with more poignancy or controversy than the accounts pertaining to the transatlantic slave trade. As scholars like Stephanie Smallwood have observed, it's essential to recognize that markets don't make people into things, but people make people into things albeit aided by the technology of the ledger book to naturalize, to formalize the buying and selling of people, to make indisputable fact out of what should otherwise be understood as the naked assertion of power. The ledger, uh, in a Smallwood's account, is the philosopher's stone in the alchemy of converting countless individuals into something that would become known in the transatlantic slave trade as a parcel of Negroes. The logbook of the Sally displayed here is a visit, vivid tra uh, testament to this transmutation. Smallwood follows a much larger tradition, a much longer tradition, of exploring what some have called the violence of accounting. And there is a rich debate regarding the power of statistics. Think Foucault and his successors who've argued about governmentality, uh, about the resource or the recourse to quantification. Think about Alfred Crosby and the interminable and ongoing debates around the rise of the West. Uh, and the emergence of what the London School of Economics accounting professor Peter Miller calls the calculating self. Yet from this contentious debate, there does seem to be little doubt that a capitalist way of seeing is crucial for further study. And it's a study, I think, as we move into this as a, as, as a sort of scholarly road that we want to follow, that will inevitably have to pay more attention to the materials and instruments that undergird that epistemology itself. Right? If you're going to argue that calculation is essential to the logic of commodification, you're going to have to pay attention to the instruments, the means of that commodification. You're going to have to take a look at that ledger book and begin to think more about it. And that's why an exhibit like this taps in fundamentally to the current scholarly fascination in a second field, material culture studies. A field that had once been associated with decorative arts and elite connoisseurship, has not only refocused on the artifacts of everyday life, but it has done so with an ins insistence in the words of David Jaffe that, quote, objects enable the social world to happen, end quote, and deserve analysis on their own terms rather than merely as illustrations of stories that emerge from textual sources. Material culture has been at the heart of early modern scholarship's fascination with consumerism, a line of inquiry now in its third decade. Richard Bushman's Refinement of America was published in 1992 in the massive volume Consumption in the Worlds of Good, World of Goods the following year. These are two texts that really did launch a thousand dissertations on the role, specific role, or the role of specific consumer goods in the formation of identities, individual and collective. Much of that work followed the earlier insight of work in historical anthropology, uh, namely Arjun Apadurai's 1986 The Social Life of Things. The approach that's embodied in almost all of this work is what I would call semantic. It's focused on meaning. As things move from hand to hand, from place to place, they acquire meaning. They shed meaning. Some things are sticky, as many competing meanings affixed to them. Others possess more stability and allow their possessors opportunities for self-fashioning. The artifacts on display here do most certainly attest to those possibilities whether explicitly in the list of uh, consumables that we would find on a number of the receipts in these display cases, or more implicitly in the ink, the pens, the stationery that facilitated the formation of what one scholar has called the mercantile persona of the early modern period. Now more recently, material culture studies have been moving away from what things mean and moving towards the question of how things work. Production is gaining on consumption as the most fruitful line of inquiry, 
and composition and design are garnering considerable attention. Concepts familiar in design, such as affordance, join the urgent call and actor network theory to recognize the agency of non-human things. Performance studies scholars like Robin Bernstein describe scriptive things, material artifacts that structure behavior akin to the way in which a script structures a play. It, predict, it creates a predictable outcome, but is open to some modest variation and might be different on one night from the next. This thinking about material culture, about the agency of things uh, in, along these lines, uh, made me think a little bit about something that's not dis on display here, but is certainly part of any exhibition about uh, 18th century business practices. And here I'm thinking of Nicholas Brown's nine and a half foot block and shell secretary. Uh, an artifact that's familiar to many of you in Providence uh, and uh, dear to uh, the, the Brown family still. Uh, did think about how that worked, right? How does that piece of furniture work? Uh, did its organizational structure of shelves, of drawers, of cubbies affect the way in which Nicholas Brown and his successors organized information? This is a question that actually came to me recently as I was moving my office, and, and I, I hope you'll pardon this diversion. Uh, but I had the chance to move all of my books into a, a different space in, in my building, but with a completely different configuration of bookshelves. And so books that I had next to one another in my previous office were reorganized in my new office, and I had the chance to put books that in one office seemed to be in very separate scholarly conversations actually next to each other in my much longer bookshelves of my new office. Now, this sounds incredibly commonplace and mundane, but I'll give you a very specific example. In my old office, books pertaining to the transatlantic slave trade of the early modern period were here, and books pertaining to plantation slavery and antebellum America were here. These conversations seemed radically unrelated to one another. In my new office, they form a logical sequence. They are connected to one another. They are juxtaposed to one another. They are next to one another. And this forces me already in the short time that I've been in this office to think about the, con the continuities and disjunctures within African American history, things that I would only see and only think about based on the materiality of my office itself, of this bookshelf, something that I don't control. They're screwed into the walls, but the fact that they are six feet long rather than four feet long creates this possibility. It facilitates a new kind of knowledge. And to that extent, it made me think that something like the secretary made by a Newport cabinet maker who may or may not have had first line mercantile practice, who may or may have not interviewed a number of clerks to examine the ways in which things get organized, uh, but nonetheless, it came into the Brown family and became a centerpiece of their practice. To what extent then did the cubbies, did the drawers, did the shelves, did the physical capacity of using this thing call into being a certain way of being a merchant? To what extent did it organize a specific way of confronting the knowledge? Did it, in fact, interact with what I called earlier a capitalist way of seeing? Moving from furniture uh, into a different facet of, of, of material culture studies, uh, materiality has been a particular preoccupation of book history, where textual analysis must share space with the ev uh, evaluation of paper, of layout, of assembly, of usage. And here I must say that I'm highly sympathetic to scholars like Michael Thwyman, who have spent their lives studying ephemera and have argued that, in fact, Printed ephemera is much more important to print culture and book history than the finished volumes that line the shelves of libraries like the John Carter Brown. This attention focuses on what some scholars call non-literary documents or utilitarian texts of functional reading. And again, as you look at this archive, you don't necessarily see treatises that should be read from beginning to end but rather as bills, as receipts, as uh, pre-printed forms, nonetheless are laden with ideological content, nonetheless are full of ideas, nonetheless convey more difficult to find than, say, a book uh, by John Locke, but convey nonetheless a whole set of ideas about how the world works and the way things should be organized. So for scholars of this kind of functional reading and of printed ephemera, they've looked at things like catalogs, road signs, bank statements, gas bills. And they've looked at such uh, materials and thought about their physicality, how they move, how they feel, how they work, uh, to move into a, a realm that one scholar, John Sidley Brown, describes as the social life of information. Paper documents, it's argued, do not merely carry information. They help make it. They structure it. They validate it. And numerous uh, studies by scholars have helped elaborate these claims, 
Uh, and these ended up being some of the more funny things that I read uh, in the course of preparing this talk. For instance, a recent ethnological account of the importance of paper memos in the supposedly paperless 21st century office. It turns out that yes, you can circulate things as PDFs, yes, you can have email attachments, but the fact that there is an actual report that exists in physical form, the act of creating that, the act of circulating that, the act of receiving that, is in many contemporary offices part of the solidarity that brings workers together as members of a team, of a division, that there's something tangible about the paper itself, about the product itself, that is crucial for how people understand themselves in these larger economic structures. Um, another sort of surprising revelation when we think about sort of print, what's available, how what's available shapes what we think, uh, had to do with the uh, history of graph paper. And it would be hard to imagine something that seems more mundane than that, but did you know that commercially available graph paper did not exist for astronomers, physicists, and mathematicians till the middle of the 19th century? And that people working in these scientific disciplines in the 1830s actually had to explain to one another how to draw a grid on a piece of paper in order then to graph or show other kinds of information visually speaking. So again, the actual physicality of the form matters a great deal to what can be thought. This exhibition activates so many of these themes, uh, ranging from the spike file, uh, which impaled documents most violently in order to keep them uh, assembled in order, to the rectangular, rectangular bundles of bills that bear the shape of the cubbies in which they were stuffed, uh, before being used, being, well, I'll use an, uh, an anachronistic term, before being archived in a trunk in the back of a counting house. But I, I don't know which case it's in, but you will see it's, it's right here. You'll see a stack of, of, of bills folded up, tied up, and basically meant to be put into the vaults, never to be looked at again unless there was some kind of adjudication that required recourse to it. But the size of that bundle might have everything to do with the cubby size that a Newport woodmaker, cabinet maker, decided to build into his cabinetry itself. Again, the materiality matters a great deal. Um, we can look around here and think about the different kinds of ledgers you see, some uh, unruled, some with ruled line, and the degree to which the access and availability of ruled paper may be important not only to business accounting, but to the social lives and work routines of clerks themselves. What would it mean, in fact, to have to draw your lines on the page before you start putting down your numbers? Uh, the organization of business information made durable in paper form, as displayed here, uh, is fundamentally a problem of material culture. Um, but it requires going a step further, because if we're going to discuss a capitalist way of seeing, as I've suggested, is one frame for understanding this exhibit, and if we're going to think about material culture uh, as another, it's necessary to engage a third scholarly conversation, uh, and that comes from the field of history of science and technology. So the last 30 years in the history of science and technology has directed our attention to the specific cultural and political, local and contingent processes of knowledge production. Great discoveries don't just happen, but are made possible through institutional support and patronage, are disseminated through specific communicative technologies and practices, and gain credence through socially constructed and contested forms of authority. This contextualist approach to the sociology of knowledge has also highlighted what the Cambridge University historian James Secord calls, quote, knowledge as practice. The recognition that skill, training, apprenticeship matter tremendously to knowledge production, as do the most material tools of the trade, like lab notebooks, graphing calculators, and dare I say even pocket protectors. New scholarship on mathematics, for instance, considers the unspoken yet widely understood rules governing the chalkboard as a site of problem solving. And again, think about the chalkboard as a technology of mathematical knowledge production. How could you find something more mundane? And yet thought taken from a critical perspective, right, the chalkboard is remarkably rich. There are clearly tacit rules that, uh, you know, that people working in labs and math buildings know or have to be explained when they violate such rules about when you can write on someone else's board, when you can solve someone else's equation. Other scholars have thought about the way in which a delimited rectangular blank space determines the representation of knowledge. Are you, in fact, confined by the walls of your blackboard? Does the blackboard determine what it is possible to think in the first place? Other scholars have thought about erasability as a function of blackboards, right? It is a technology, but it is an impermanent technology. And the fact that it is ephemeral and disappears as someone erases it makes it very hard to reconstruct processes of discovery and knowledge production. Others have thought about the place of the chalkboard in the physical space of math buildings and laboratories. 
uh, and the relationship of the chalkboard to a specific disciplinary uh, identity and perspective. In some places, it's really cool to be covered in chalk dust. In others, not so much. But that's made possible by this technology, and it's a technology that's crucial to knowledge production, even as it is itself a blank slate, quite literally. Uh, to take another example, Andrew Warwick's award-winning 2003 book, The Masters of Theory, uh, offers a history of the modern math test emerging from the physics pedagogy of 19th century Cambridge. Warwick points out that until the 1830s and 1840s, it was new to ask people to take a math test, to give people a piece of paper and a pencil and tell them to solve equations in a short amount of time. That previous math pedagogy had worked in a different way, but it was only, as he argues, through this form of pen and, uh, pencil and paper testing did physicists in Cambridge find a way of translating Newtonian ideas into a more broadly applicable set of understandings to popularize that in essence. So Secord, who I mentioned a moment ago, pushes us further in his call for scholars to devote new attention to knowledge in transit. So if knowledge is uh, practice and practice is knowledge, knowledge is also always in transit as a communicative enterprise governed by patterns of circulation, audience, and reader response, in effect borrowing some of the foundational methods of book history. For historians of science, then, this may mean considering how the publication schedule of journals, whether they're quarterlies or annuals, shape a discipline's perspective on the speed of discovery. This may mean attention to the processes of translation, whereby information moves from a field notebook into a published paper. More generically, this may mean asking how the modes of publicizing information forge new networks and solidarities among those gaining access to it simultaneously in time, but located remotely from one another. That is to say, if we all have a subscription to the same journal, we're all reading these things in different places, are we in fact creating what scholars in a different context would call an imagined community? If this is true, not in the context of nationalism, but in the context of disciplinary practice, it provides a really important way of thinking about what circulates in the world of early modern mer merchants. Right, the degree to which a packet ship that brings you mail from a distant port, the degree to which lining up price currents that may have arrived from Amsterdam and Paris on the same day puts you in a feeling of solidarity, helps establish networks of trust, helps create a constant Atlantic mercantile identity among people located far from one another and bound together from primarily through a shared culture of honor, reputation, and trust. At the same time, there's a more, I would call it, um, pessimistic strain in the history of science and technology, noting that instruments determine what's possible and that what's possible uh, determine what a lot, to a large extent is possible to think in the first place. So from this limiting perspective, right, um, technology forecloses new ways of thinking and new ways of organizing information. Technologies foster path dependence, and there's no better uh, example of this in the world of business history than, of course, in the QWERTY keyboard, right? The Q-W-E-R-T-Y keyboard, whose existence owes to the specific mechanical problems of creating a typewriter in the 1870s, but which remains with us 130, 140 years later, despite its proven inefficiency relative to other ways of laying out a keyboard. So if, in fact, the market is always geared towards working towards new technologies that are ever more efficient, and if studies have proven that different keyboard configurations can improve productivity data input by 20 to 40 percent, why do we still have the QWERTY keyboard? There are many reasons uh, for this, but the, the history of QWERTY and its persistence is one of the things that alerts us to path dependence and suggests that as we consider all of these things as path dependence, uh, path-dependent technologies that exist not merely because of their proven efficiency, but also because of convention, also because uh, of the costs that might be greater uh, to replace them, to retrain people, uh, because of sentimental attachment to certain ways of doing things, that to think about any technology, we must take into account uh, that there's a complicated set of human relations that structure the production of capitalist knowledge across these great distances. So it's been my hope tonight uh, in this talk to weave together three scholarly conversations uh, under the umbrella of the paper technologies of capitalism. To think about uh, capitalist ways of seeing, to focus on the material forms that facilitated ways of seeing but also represented what was, saw, what was seen, and ultimately to embed the ensuing system of knowledge in the history of science and technology attentive to the limitations of instrumentation and the assertions of authority.
The cross-fertilization of these conversations should be abundantly obvious. So for historians of capitalism who are thinking about capitalist ways of seeing, to be in a separate conversation from material culture and to be ignorant of history of science and technology is really uh, you know, inexcusable. Uh, and it's one of the ways in which I think this new field of history capitalism is going to gain strength in the coming years is as its practitioners move more into these questions. What I'm hoping that my talk will have done tonight is to, of course, set you up to spend time with this exhibition, to condition you to look in these display cases here around the, the, the JCB with fresh eyes, to see not in front of you simply some printed ephemera, some detritus of commercial life, some receipts and things that you actually can't believe were saved. And you may, in fact, wonder, gosh, if someone were doing this for 2012, you know, would they really want to see my receipt from the stop and shop? Right? But if you can come to these kinds of documents, if you can come to these kinds of artifacts with new eyes, you will see much more. I mean, to take one example to close with, just think about any of the ledgers that are on display here in the library. Right, looking closely at an 18th century ledger, uh, the first thing you'll notice is probably the indecipherability of the scrawl. But this should not, in fact, stop you from asking further questions. This must be the opening of our inquiry, not the end of it. But just begin by asking questions about something as fundamental as ink, right? That scrawl is written in ink. Where does ink come from? What is the commodity chain that brings certain kinds of, 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 of crushable, uh, mixable entities from distant parts of the globe to a city like Providence for people to then mix and to write? The scholar Adrian Johns has called ink the magic potion of the 18th century because to make good ink was a kind of trade secret and it's something that was protected uh, greatly by, by, by printers who when it came to making ink saw themselves as possessors of secret recipes as opposed to merely tradesmen. To think about ink connects you to big questions about how social life is organized, how knowledge is organized about commodity change and the connection between people in one part of the globe and another. But think more. What explicit and tacit knowledge was involved in cutting the quill that was necessary to write in that ledger? Who taught a young clerk how to cut the end of a feather? And I think there's a beautiful one uh, in a ledger book uh, in, in this case here, right? How, in fact, was such information conveyed? Could you find information about this in the book? Did someone have to tell you? If so, did people tell you wrong because this was part of the hazing that was involved of bringing new clerks into uh, a counting house? Were clerks initiated as adepts into this knowledge community? What solidarities might have emerged from this shared set of practices? As we move from ink and pen to paper itself, we think about the supply chain of paper, from the rag picker to the paper maker to the stationer, and the ways in which then to the merchant connects people at the very bottom of society to people at the very top. And so the entire social history of a capitalist society becomes vivid in the paper itself, in its plain existence. So from these deceptively simple questions, we find ourselves confronting what have traditionally been the largest questions in business history, right? Questions of production, questions of distribution, questions of consumption. But from the humble artifacts that are on display here, I think, and it is my hope, and I encourage you to, to, to do this, that as we try to answer those questions, we can appreciate the complexity of them, we can pose them and approach them uh, in far more interesting ways, and we can appreciate everything we see here not as simply ephemera that has content that is meaningless to you. You don't actually care that the ship so-and-so arrived in Providence in 1789 and this is what's on it. You don't actually care that six yards of rope were sold to this man on this date. What's actually written down in these books may be less important to you than the form of the books, the form of the documents, the form of the paper itself. And it's by thinking about form rather than content that we can tap into capitalist ways of seeing, that we can tap into material culture, and that we can tap into the knowledge communities that ultimately would structure the rise of modern capitalism. With that, I thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. 
Absolutely. And I think the trick is to see things that appear to be artless and see them as artful. Right? It is not an accident that a book is ruled in a certain way, that a form is printed in a certain way. That's invention. That's invention. Now, is it the product of a particular inventor, right? We can identify people uh, in, in, in job printing, most famously Benjamin Franklin, right? Who have ideas about how things should look and print them to look that way. But if you study the archive, you can see the kind of conversation that exists between printers, between merchants, between uh, judicial officials. Uh, look at forms in which people cross out, you know, in allegiance to the king in the summer of 1776 on a bill of lading, right? And write something else in that place. In other places, allegiance to God, people may cross out uh, on, on some of these documents as well. And the degree to which new legal regulations uh, determine what can be pursued in court, how damages can be claimed, will change the content of uh, a given pre-printed document. And that may send printers back to the shop making new things, but as merchants find it convenient to cross out some of those things, as legislators find it convenient to change the wording of a specific statute, all of this is completely in flux. But there's a history to the creation of these things that appear to be merely mundane. Yes, please. Uh, oh, wonderful talk. I was wondering if you might also want to add in something about history of education, particularly history of, of numeracy and, and math education, in terms of what, what is necessary for someone to even be able to perform these kinds of calculations and how math is taught. To oh, absolutely. Uh, and that's not something that I, I have a great deal of knowledge of myself. But I think that um, if you take this exhibit as a whole, uh, probably the most fruitful, I think, avenue for, for understanding it would have to do with the education of the clerk, right? The creation of the counting house culture and the degree to which young men uh, are taught how to write, are taught how to add and subtract, are taught how to keep the books, are taught how to present themselves as members of a mercantile community, that the clerk's evolution in training uh, really is crucial to the function of this entire enterprise, right? That in fact there are, and I, I will use another anachronistic term, they are sort of the knowledge workers of this economy even as the work that they may be doing seems incredibly mundane to us. Others would argue that in fact they are the first generation to encounter paperwork and mind-numbing office uh, space kind of experiences, and this may be true as well. But certainly there's a question of pedagogy involved in this and the degree to which mathematical education will change over the course of the 18th to the 19th century will have consequences for how this plays out. So I appreciate that suggestion. Yeah, Rick. Um, it seems to me that uh, the way in which we present packet information has kind of diversified over the past 100 or 200 years or so uh, we present information via audio, video, integrated multimedia, different web platforms that allow us to pack information differently. Now, to the extent that you were saying that uh, these paper technologies shape not only how we think, but what we think, do you think that an increased diversity in the methods of portraying information would lead to an increased diversity in the kinds of uh, knowledge that we will produce? It's a, a, a great question, and of course I'll take the, the scoundrel's refuge in, I'm merely a historian. I can't possibly predict what the future will hold. Um, but those are, I think you, you, you draw out a, 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 a fruitful set of possibilities here. That as, um, as new technologies have lowered the cost of information, as new technologies have allowed uh, uh, people from their own homes to have the capacity to design official documents that previously only you know, state-sanctioned printers had at their disposal, this is crucial. But at the same time, take paper money, it's, right? You can't, even with your really cool laser printer, print off green things that say $1, the United States of America on them. The FBI will come for you. They will come quickly for you, right? Uh, and, and, and this is actually something that, that people have, have, have written about, is here we are in this sort of cashless age. Here we are in this highly sophisticated world of finance. And yet when some Yahoo runs a $50 bill off his color copier, they are on him in an instant, as though this were the greatest threat to the sovereignty of the United States of America. And there's an interesting way in which the sanctity of our paper money as a print technology has a kind of hold on the state that may, give, that may complicate the idea that, in fact, it's all going to become a free-for-all. That's one area where it certainly won't. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, one of the things that you didn't mention, but that's occurred to me as I've read 18th century records, 
is that in a very real way, knowledge is power. And I was struck by it particularly when I was reading um, the copy book of Paul Cuffey's father. Paul Cuffey's father was literate. He was enslaved, he was African born, he was enslaved, he was then freed, and he became relatively successful. And his copy book is at the New Bedford Public Library, in which somebody taught him not only to write, but also to keep accounts. And I realized that if you're a free African American, being able to keep accounts would be critical in not being taken advantage of. So the ability to keep your own records and to be able to take your record keeping and, and settle accounts with the person who's your creditor or who you're doing business with would be really a crucial piece. So the whole who did the writing, which people kept their own accounts, which people hired clerks, you trust the clerk to be honest. Right. Who doesn't have access to that technology and therefore, and that that knowledge and therefore is being taken advantage of? How many people are signing by mark? But it's also how many people go into a shop and the shopkeeper says, "You owe me six pounds ten," and the person themselves doesn't have any way to say, "No, I don't. It's only five. Right. In a, in a legal regime, we should add where their ability to adjudicate this in court would be jeopardized by their racial status, right? So I mean, it's, it's well, it racial also, or class. That's right. That's the, right. I mean, it's class too. Right. No, I mean, you, you pointed to to an interesting set of possibilities here as well. And I'm sorry that, that Phil Gould isn't is, isn't longer, any longer here. Sort of, I, I think is, is the best person to talk to about 18th century African American writing and the degree to which yeah. a specific kind of numerical writing would be crucial to the kind of freedom claims and aspirations of free people of color uh, here in New England. So this is something worth following up on, but, but I thank you for, for, for raising it. I know there's a question the way. Yes, please. Uh, so I, I really liked uh, how you described the kind of project of the history of capitalism as a effort in denaturalizing capitalism and making us think about the ways in which Capitalist practice and capitalist thinking, capitalist ideology are not uh, the way things always had to be. Uh, and so, I guess a sort of uh, optimistic just question about the exhibit. Uh, the answer to this may just be no. Um, but are there any interesting examples of like, paths not taken? So you mentioned the example of if you weren't some sort of path dependent uh, with behaviors like the Kirby keyboard getting us to where we are today. Is there anything that we can see in the exhibit that are kind of glimpses of how it might have been? That's a good question. Um, my sense is that there are plenty of exhibits and plenty of, of things on display here that will make you scratch your head and say, why was it like this? Right? Why did we need to move the same information from five different pieces to one final official authoritative book that may or may not be true, right? Why is it that the record keeping operated in this level of detail? Because that was certainly overkill, right? And to move from letters to day books to waste books to, you know, so on and so forth. And, and, and Kim has juxtaposed these in, in which case is it? Number two, uh, you can see sort of you know some some things that would strike us as as, as woefully in, inefficient, uh, and, and it immediately occurs to us that, that, that they should have thought of a better way of, of, of doing this, especially if these claims are true that this is an age of, of extreme rationalism and, and precision. Um, but whether or not we can see things in this exhibition exhibition that point to paths not taken more explicitly. Uh, I can't actually say. This is one of those places where, in fact, the collective knowledge of this group, now armed with the framework for looking at these, uh, these uh, artifacts, may in fact yield that, that, that observation. I'll be very curious to hear. Please. Um, I just had a question about, you frame a lot of this around the idea 
evolution of the late 16th and early 17th, or late, late 17th, early 18th century uh, as really emerging out of debates regarding uh, alchemy, capital punishment, and the slave trade. And somewhere buried towards the end of that book, uh, he coins the term credit fetishism, which is a play on, on, on Marx's notion of commodity fetishism, the degree to which the, 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 the commodity form blinds us to uh, all of the sort of the, the, all of the sort of exploitation and social relations that create this one final product that seems to be uh, detached from its production. Wonderland argues that in fact uh, for the early modern for the financial revolution it's a kind of credit fetishism which is not for not looking ahead and understanding the implications of who's going to be bought who's going to be sold who's going to be dislocated based on your speculative engagement with with investment. And I think this notion of a fetish, uh, credit fetishism, is one way that we can push forward on your very useful observation that capitalist ways of not seeing deserve a place in this conversation. Absolutely. Yes, please. Um, thank you for the talk. How does the, the invisible hand in the market of demand and supply value the life for a slave? And how does it come to it? I'm curious about that. Well, that 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 is a huge question. Um, right? I mean, the, the, the first thing is, is, is uh, you know to, to to come back to a point that I made earlier that the, the, the market doesn't enslave people; people enslave people. And using that observation, uh, scholars have, have argued that you know it, it's not uh, this invisible hand that that seems to be sort of working on its own, it's specific people in specific places making choices about whether or not to invest their money, to tie up their ships, uh, to uh, subject themselves to certain kinds of uncertainties and physical violence uh, in plantation societies by sending ships from one continent to move people uh, to a second continent, generally to create wealth for a third. And so I think most of the new histories of capitalism have been interested not in suggesting that the slave trade itself functions simply uh, as an undifferentiated commodity, and so that you can tell the history of the slave trade and its value and pricing in the same way that you can tell the history of the grain trade, but rather to say that may have been how investors, slave traders, plantation owners had hoped it would work, but that was part of their ideological project of needing to erase all of the messiness, all of the contingency from this, and that we're much better off telling this history not merely as an undifferentiated commodity, but a hugely problematic commodity based on the fact that enslaved Africans were not cows and were not hogs head of grain and were not bars of iron, but people who didn't want to be there. And the architecture of the slave ship itself is a testament to that, to the differentiation of these kind of commodities. Now go, please. Well, it, it, it seems to me um, that by and large the history of capitalism, as it's traditionally been told, has been temporally bounded, uh, basically beginning in the 19th century with the arrival of the factory system and, and using wage labor as its fundamental social relation. It's been overwhelmingly preoccupied with the corporation and the rise of the firm. Uh, and insofar as history of capitalism until quite recently has been organized around either Marxist categories of privilege the wage or Schindlerian categories of privilege the firm, a great deal of the history has been left out. So I think the first thing that uh, talking about capitalism in a room full of, of, of 18th century documents does is expand the time frame of the history of capitalism and to recognize and to incorporate forms that we might not otherwise be inclined to think is matter. So for instance, in the traditional narrative, we don't really think of mercantilism as capitalism. Mercantilism is some other kind of form. The state's too involved. It's got to get out of the way and let private enterprise do its thing. But I think as we recognize the importance of the state, whether through imperial expansion, whether through the enforcement of contracts, whether through its role in financial bailouts, scholars are no longer so worked up about the state and recognize that the state is never absent from capitalism. So we might as well deal with periods of time in which the state is a fundamental actor 
uh, in generating new kinds of wealth that flows into private hands and creates opportunities for technology investment. So the 17th and 18th century, we're, we're cool with that. When we think about not wage labor, but think about human commodification, and think about the degree to which the market is capable of, of, of turning labor into something that can be bought in any number of different kinds of parcels, perhaps by the hour and the day, but also by the lifetime, and that there are more continuities than differences in this kind of labor commodification, we can take slavery seriously as part of this as well. I think slavery uh, matters more than, than historians of capitalism have, have yet been willing to see, fundamentally just recognizing the importance of sugar and cotton uh, to the world of capitalism in the 18th and 19th century. These are the commodities that are akin to what oil was in the 20th century. So that, that, that's where I think you get a transformation. Caitlin, please. So I was really struck as you were speaking about not just the big technology of capitalism, but the big technology of commodities, the big technology of industries. And I was just wondering how we sort out what comes in the big technology of capitalism, and whether everything, all the business papers count as in, or if we have to be looking for the more specific types of documents. That's a good, it's a good question, and uh, you know, this is a question I should be posing to you. Uh, for those of you who don't know Caitlin <laughs> Rosenthal, she is sort of, she is uh, the historian uh, of 18th century accounting, and uh, the person who has, who has spent more time, uh, I believe, uh, than anyone but perhaps Kim and the late James Hedges uh, in the Brown Family <laughs> Business Papers. Um, so you have a better sense of, of, of what's there necessarily than I do. Uh, it seems to me, uh, and again, this was what my goal in this talk, is to put out paper technologies and capitalism as something to think with. And if it proves durable, that's awesome. And if it proves to be a dead end, I can live with that. I got other cold, you know, other items. <laughs> um, but but the, basic idea, the basic idea is that uh, just looking at documents to ask whether this applies, to what way is this a technology, may in fact bring new questions to what I would otherwise fear is just an archive of bills and receipts. I have time for one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, really, in your talk, you mentioned about these technologies have a certain kind of agency or how they be useful to think of them as having. Like, how do you think of them? Do you think you can elaborate on that a little bit? On what would it mean for a document to have agency? Right. Well, so there's a large sort of movement coming particularly out of, of science studies and largely associated with the scholar Bruno Latour uh, to think about non-human actors as, as agents and to think about the ways in which uh, things may have tremendous power. So the classic example is the speed bump. Here's this inanimate thing, it's put there, it actually shapes people's behavior. It makes them do things that they don't want to do. That's rather remarkable. But to take this ahead and think about the ways in which a pre-printed form creates possibilities for taking, seeing some things and not seeing other things because there are blanks that you fill in and other places, there are no blanks for certain kind of things. That's one of the ways in which I think a paper can function as, an, as, as a material uh, artifact with agency. Uh, and I think this applies uh, in other ways to other kinds of technologies that have been associated with capitalist practice. I mean, when we think about the stock ticker and we, we think about that, you know, uh, that reel of tape with, with, with symbols and numbers on it, you know, that creates certain kind of possibilities for the people interacting with it. Uh, you can say, well, it's just a matter of intensifying the speed of information flow but you can also study all the ways in which it calls into being, new ways of talking, new ways of thinking, new ways of moving between your office and the, and, and the exchange floor. And so here's this technology, here's this piece of paper that actually dictates human behavior rather than the other way around. As these technologies gain sort of popularity, people who are assimilated into the system assimilate to the technology rather than assimilating the technology to the demands of the people at that time. I, I mean, it, it's again, something worth thinking through, but I think it's tantalizing. Let me thank you all for your time tonight and, and, and take Margaret's prerogative of inviting you to a lovely reception and, 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 and drinks. Thank you so much.